Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time of the week. Welcome to Watch News Weekly. Before we get started, Marco, welcome. If anybody's wondering why a diehard Eagles fan is wearing a 49ers jersey, I lost the bet. And I have to wear this jersey for the day. Shout out to Michael. But I'm a man of my word, so I have a McCaffrey jersey on. You guys can't see the bat. Yeah, he ran rough shot all over you guys. It was bad. I was at the game, and uh, we were actually sitting, like, face with the 49ers. When and, you like, say you, I know you're Canadian, but you're still in Philly. What do you mean you? Us. Like, you guys. You. No, us. No, no, I'm not a, I'm not an Eagles fan, right? Oh, yeah, which, who's, who? who? <laughs> Listen. This video is about to get, like, everybody's about, about to, to click it, out of this video. It's, it's about to get ugly. Yeah, no, no. So, so the thing is, I'm from Montreal, right? I grew up a hockey fan first. And in Montreal, they have the Canadians, which is probably the most historic franchise in hockey. But as a natural-born contrarian, I can never go for the Canadians. You know, I have to be against everything that's normal, right? Well, that, so, you just like to argue. Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went for the, the team that was their number one biggest enemy, at least by modern standards, and that is the Boston Bruins. So I've been a Boston fan sports ever since the Celtics, the Bruins, and the Patriots especially. Okay, pop quiz. How many hockey leagues are actually out there? Hockey leagues? Yeah. Uh, well, Most of them are in Canada. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a ton. Fourteen. Yeah, there's a ton. Fourteen, so many, quote unquote, major ones. There's so, so many in Europe, and then obviously. In, no, but most in of them in Canada. Most yeah, of the major ones. Anyway, let's. Uh, this is a, a news episode, so enough about sports. Let's talk about the ever continuing drama with the Christie's auctions. Now, uh, that was the auction where Mohammed Zaman was selling off a most incredible collection. Total sale was forty-two million and change. Now, of course. The controversy started where all of a sudden an hour before the auction. Actually, the auction was delayed by an hour. Yeah. yeah. And no, it was delayed. Wasn't it delayed by a like couple hours? A couple right? hours, right. Yeah, and yeah. then right before the auction, all of a sudden, all the mins, all the estimates changed, right? Yep. To a significantly higher number. And, of course, the mysterious paddle 1013, was it? The mysterious paddle 1013 all of a sudden pretty much bought most of the lot at their minimum estimate, mm -hmm. which the prices were high. Like, for example, the Brando Rolex, it was initially estimated one to two million, I think, yeah. ended up fetching, uh, what, 5.3 million? Yeah, but that might have also just been bid up, uh, for example, right? So the estimate, if I'm not mistaken, was around like two or so million. Uh, that had been raised from like one, one or so million. And I actually thought it was gonna go under that estimate, just given, I don't know, I, I didn't think it was gonna hit that much, but uh, yeah, that's a crazy sale. Well, it continues. Well, first of all, there was some drama in regards to them taking on a guarantor, right? So yeah. auction houses are able to take on a guarantor that's going to guarantee every watch in the auction, some watches in the auctions, i.e. saying that, look, I will, I am putting up the money, Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming, again, we don't know exact details how they work these things out, but if uh, my assumption is I come in and I say, look, guys, you have $50 million worth a lot. I will guarantee the, minimum, the minimums, right, or the reserves, meaning that if they don't sell to anyone else, I'm buying them out at the minimum. You guys get your fees and the whole to do. Then whatever over, and then they split the profit somehow, yeah. some way. It's, it's sort of an investment, right? right? Well, you having kind of more experience in the, in the auction space, right? This is not uncommon for them to do. It's not. Right. It is not uncommon. In fact, if you go to their rules, regulations, uh, terms, right. and conditions, you can read about uh, guarantee, uh, guaranteed bidders and, yeah. and things of that nature and changing the... So legally, I don't know if they did anything wrong. Right? Yeah. It's a lot of small print, basically. Because that's what the main controversy was, right? It was like right. this idea, like, basically you, swept, you took the rug out from under everybody and said, oh, listen, we just have a guarantor last minute, and then... You know, people were upset because they were like, oh, this is fraud and deception, et cetera, et But it's not. But it's not. It right. is not fraud. It is exactly. not deception. It is yeah. all perfectly legal. But now the drama continues because Christie's impounded the $43 million worth of watches and Zaman filed a civil complaint, right? Because they're preventing the bidders, no, for the watches to reach their bidders. And now I'm wondering what that could be about. I just don't understand. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand either. It doesn't really make much sense, uh, in my opinion, the watches were sold unless the, the buyers didn't pay. The guarantor? Yeah. Because which, most of them were bought by the guarantor. Yeah, exactly. The mysterious so, paddle, uh, you know, 1013. Unless they never paid, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't see what the holdup is. Uh, too much drama with auctions as of late. Only yeah. watch, this, that, but. It's not, it's not great, that's for sure. Especially with, uh, the oak collection is coming up, right? So yeah. that that's going to be a big, big, uh, big indicator as to what will happen kind of next year. It's a good, good kind of segue into next year. Well, we'll see what happens. Let's move to the next topic, and that is new Grupo Forza, new entry level watch. Let's start with the fact that this watch retails for 160 thousand Swiss francs, right? Which is about 180 thousand dollars. Yeah. This is their uh, new entry level watch, and you know what? 
if you followed Grubel Forge over the years, you can very well say that at that price point, that's a cheap Grubel Forge. Yeah. Considering they came out of the gate at three hundred plus, all the way out to six, seven, eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars. The and handmade this is, one is over a million bucks. Yeah, Balancia three, right? Uh, black, blue variants, so two variants, uh, eighty-eight pieces in each uh, color, right? What uh, what did they change with um, the Balancia three? It, it's really essentially the layout, right? So as far as what I can tell, is uh, the dial layout has changed a lot in the sense that now they actually have three bridges on the dial, but otherwise it's the same basic time format in the sense that you have a power reserve indicator, uh, as far as I know you have a subsidiary of seconds, and then you have the, the balance wheel on the top. It, it, it looks um, you know, slightly different, but overall mechanically the complications are the same. So it's really just mechanically it's just as good as it gets, I've always said it before. I think also the case is different in, in this case, right? So like the case has been re resized and reshaped. Well, it's, uh, they're, 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 they went down to the 43 millimeter size with this yeah. one. Is this one even smaller? Um, so no, I know they went down to 41 millimeters. So this actually may be a little bit of a bigger size So uh, from what I can tell. Uh, aesthetic changes, Yeah. Uh, horologically nothing changes. Now let's not downplay that because as I've said it before, on record, Grubel Forza is some of the best made, if not the best made watches out on the market today. Sure. And then not just among independents, I mean among everyone. So uh, listen, aesthetic changes, new model, it's like a new Samarino or a new Royal Oak and, and right. so on and so forth. There's, there's nothing crazy about it. Do I like the watch aesthetically versus the last one? I can't say yes or no. It's just like my eyes are so used to seeing yeah. the previous aesthetic that it takes a little bit of time of getting used to it. And I don't even think it's relevant to judge which one looks better. It's just a matter of preference. It's pretty surprising also, I think, for Grubel Forcey to come out with another new release, especially this year, because they came out with the mid, the not mid-size, they're smaller size. The small size. size the smaller what size. It is. Then they came out with the carbon case ones. They also came out with this. And then not to mention the new invention piece. It seems like they're going heavy on the new releases, which I don't know. It's, it's very unexpected, but hey, chapeau to uh, Grubel Force is pretty cool. All right, let's go to the next uh, uh, topic, and that is actually one I'm most excited about is the new RM3503 automatic Rafael Nadal. Now, for those of you going to say, oh, another TPT watch, oh, another Rafael Nadal, let's jump on a bandwagon, this Salt Lake Hotcakes, a silver list, this, that, and the other. Automatic themed sports mode butterfly, uh, uh, what do you call it, rotor. Okay. Now, at a glance, I'm like, oh, okay, when I first started reading about it, I'm like, okay, they changed the road, and then I read deeper, and this watch is, it's, it's outstanding at what it does. So the butterfly rotor, right? You'll notice there's a button at seven o'clock, right? This time around, now before you used to be able to adjust at which rate your watch would be wound. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, you would have to take the watch to Richard Mule, they would make adjustments, they would open the back of the watch up, make the adjustment, make your rotor faster, slower. Yeah, depending and also on your change the, the shape of it. So change the shape of it yeah. and so on and so forth. It's, it's geometry, basic geometry, yeah. right? In this case, you're able to do it yourself. If you want to go into sports mode, this thing literally releases uh, a, a titanium and a metal part into the rotor, therefore changing its ge geometry on the fly. As you do it and you depress that button at seven o'clock, you actually feel it, it's like Transformers. Like yeah. it's, 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 what's his name? It's Iron Man all over. Yeah, and over above the mechanics, it's just a good looking, it's, it's so good looking. What watch out there, if any, allows you to adjust on a fly the speed at which your rotor works? You yeah. Watch based on your lifestyle. I mean, Erwork has the whole stop the rotor function on their watches. The, the little turbines. That, yeah, exactly, but that doesn't that doesn't change the, the actual variable doesn't change, geometry. It doesn't change the yeah. geometry. You're literally yeah, yeah. changing a part inside yeah. your watch. Yeah, which is on the fly, I mean, that's this is super, super impressive, and god damn, this thing is sick. This thing is awesome. Is that a technical term? Yeah, it's a technical term. Sick? Yeah. It's like sick. Yeah, as sick as I am right now wearing, this, wearing this jersey. <laughs> right? Is that what, is that what yeah, you're going at? Pretty much, yeah. Bravo to Richard Meal. Anybody out there that's going to say, oh, they're just toy watches or Happy Meal watches and so on and so forth, do some in-depth reading in regards to, and imagine what it would take to make something like this. Now, let me ask you this, because in the past, um, or last year specifically, uh, myself, yourself, and Adrian kind of said that Richard Mill were straying away from their DNA them being kind of such an innovative brand, right? We've seen a number of new releases, namely in this uh, configuration, new quartz, uh, or sorry, TPT uh, materials in different colors, etc. Even the new kind of bubble, which has that white and pink, which was insane. Um, do you think they're getting back on the right track, or um, I don't, th I don't do think they were, I don't think they were ever off it? track. I think that they push the envelope every year that I've been in business. Whether the, if, if the concentration one time was on pushing the envelope on use of materials, then that's what it was. Yeah. If the concentration was on horology, then that's what it was. There hasn't been a single year. If you go back to the releases of Richard Mille, maybe we should do a separate video. But we go back 22 years now, I can pick more than one watch 
that will show innovation for that year. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, uh, this was something me and Adrian discussed when we were talking about. Uh, it was a video we did. Why Richard Mill watches are so expensive, right? It was kind of like. Richard Mill got away from like the technology of the Bubba's and the you know the the initial kind of releases uh, orthohompic turbions and all this kind of crazy stuff. But they didn't really. And then and then they went to the Smileys, the rock stars. This was kind of more. Uh, let's appeal to a certain crowd, hype, celebrity, that right. kind of well, market. Listen, and you, I think if, this if is them going back to the roots. If you're a roots. company, if you're a company that is so popular, that is so on top of the food chain, of the who of who in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. the ultra rich, really, rich and famous, if you Yeah, think, the billionaires think, boys club. You know what I mean? So yeah. if you're going to, uh, you don't necessarily have to appeal to that crowd with horological wonders, because 99 out of 100 of those people are not buying it for the horological wonders. Yeah. 99 out of 100 people that are gonna buy this are not gonna buy it because of that adjustable, yeah. Geom uh, yeah. ge geometrically adjustable rotor, butterfly rotor. Right. You know what I mean? So they're gonna buy it because it's a new Nadal. Right, but they're still, they don't have to keep with the roots. They could have used the old movement and just gave it a new case and a new look, but yeah, they did. That's true. They didn't have to come out with the plate, the Ferrari watch, right? The, the thinnest watch in the world. They didn't have to do that. It would sell regardless, right? But yet they did. And I don't know what it took to get there, but And they still have an yet to see one of those uh, Ferrari watches. Yeah, same here. Yeah. The next one is, yeah, this, this week is just full of wonderful surprises for me personally. I don't know about you. Knights of the Round Table by Roger Dubuis. Probably one of the very, very few watches from Roger Dubuis that you cannot find at list and would most likely have to pay over list no matter. This is version number three, I believe. They've done two versions prior to that. And the Knights of the Round Table is probably the most artesian, one of the most artesian watches in the watch world, not just from Roger Dubuis. Artisanal? Artisanal, thank Artisanal. you. Ar what did I say, artesian? artesian? Is that a word? <laughs> is that a that's, new that's culture? What, it's it's like, what they say in San Francisco it's, yeah, okay. when the Eagles win. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, with that said, artisanal watches in the world. Now, I put them up there right in line with some of the artisanal watches from Bacheron Constantine, yeah. right? I'll put them up there with the enamel paddocks, but I will put them a step above your, I don't want to call it simple, but an enamel dial watch. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the type of, uh, I mean, look, it took, I remember for the original one, I did a video on this. The original uh, Knights of the Round Table, it took an artist a full six months to create the figurines for one watch. Yeah, which it was Because it's done by hand. And this one, they took this to the next level, like, like, you, like I couldn't have even thought of this, all right? Titanium Damascus. Now, Damascus steel is usually steel, titanium, whatever metal is. It's usually made when you stack a bunch of metals together, you squeeze them and then you mold them into one piece of metal and then you cut something out of it. This time they did it with titanium and, you know, and it's literally hammered. Like that, that, that metal has to be hammered in order to achieve that Damascus. Right. You have to forge it. Yep. It's forged and hammered. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. In fact, that's, so Damascus steel stuff is one of, like, sometimes I'll go down the YouTube hole and I watch videos where people make stuff, yeah, like make build houses, yeah, yeah. And, and you know they'll make Damascus knives out of like a like bunch of bolts, or like that. you yeah, know, yeah. and I go down that rabbit hole that those videos yeah, keep yeah. popping it's up. Awesome. Let's, let's show the watch real quick. A bunch of things stand out right away. Obviously the same craftsmanship as when it comes to figurines, no questions about it. If you guys want to actually learn more in details about the Knights at the Round Table, I did a whole separate video for it on one of my older what's on my desks. Number one, obviously, is the Damascus titanium. You know how often do you hear Damascus titanium? Titanium is not easy to forge, Yeah. right? So let's Very start there. Way. Second of all, you sort of have, now the bezel is lifted from the watch, right? And you have a window into this, and they added more depth. If you look at it from the side, you have this crystal, uh, you have this crystal that you can now see through, and what they did there is they added more depth. On the original first and second versions of the Knights of the Round Table, it wasn't, there wasn't as much depth. Right? Yeah. yeah, the knights were there. The it was pretty flat. Yeah, you were it was, looking it was still, it was still it. pretty flat because you were forced to look at it from the top. Here, now you can look at this thing from the side. And let's go to the next slide and look at the table itself. These knights, I actually, you see them standing around the actual table. Yeah, no, this is insane. Uh, th this, this is an absolute insane of a watch. I know, I don't know, what, it didn't say what the price tag on this watch. I think it was somewhere around 300, okay, 300,000 Swiss. Right. So we're talking about about $340,000 in today's money. And I will tell you, and that's the first thing people asked me when I was, I remember selling the original Knights of the Round Table. It was like, uh, it was, at that time it was, it was, um, it was, Around 100, no, 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 it was, it was under 200 when the first ones came out and they were selling for over 200. Uh, as subsequent ones, they did like a crystal one, a crystal dial, it was a beautiful blue crystal dial. That was a little more money, but they always sold over list. 
And rightfully so, with a piece like this, I think that $300,000 is extremely justifiable. And the last thing I want to say about it is that prices are driven by the horology. Right? You would agree with that. Yeah. Sometimes it's like diamond. Well, let's take the diamond Wait, pieces on. out of the equation. For a Roger de Bouy? No, in general. If you look at watches in general. No, it's hype, nine times out of ten. What do you mean by type? Hype, hype. Like no, 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 no. I'm talking about strictly retail. Forget hype. Retail prices from the manufacturer oh, yeah. across major brands oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. are driven by complication. Yeah, complication. Your plain watch is going to be the cheaper side. Then you move up in complication. It's, the more complications, the more expensive. It yeah, gets. there's there's the markup for the name, and then there's the cost of labor and materials. And of that course, kind of but yeah. at the end of the day, you're, you're going to pay a lot more for a perpetual calendar or a Turbion than you're going to pay for a plain Jane watch, right? Sure. If it's in the same realm yeah. in terms of materials. Roger de Bouy, this is a time-only watch. This is not a complicated watch, right? by, yeah. all, by all means. It's driven by the in-house caliber, nothing crazy. But yet, often people have a hard time justifying, or used to have a hard time justifying 300,000 price tag for a watch that's a time-only watch. But we've gotten away from those times. Yeah, and but it's, it's, the success of Richard Mille. The thing is, is, this is also an artisanally made watch, right? It's like rare handcrafts from Artisan? Protect yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's like the rare handcrafts from Patek Philippe, right? They're they're painted an enamel dial cell. You know, they're only in some cases time only watches. They sell far beyond that of a Calatrava. And why is that? Well, because there's few makers in the world who can actually make a dial like that, right? And also you have to take into consideration the labor failure rates because you have to, in most cases, do the dial multiple times because at the end of the day, if it's not perfect, they throw it out. So in this case, if they're sculpted, the the amount of people who can sculpt. Uh, these kind of miniature figures. There's probably a few in the world. Maybe only one person in the I'm world can, trying to remember the could, can name. do this, right? So you have to take into consideration cost of labor, cost of materials, the time it will take. All of these things factor into price. So yeah, no doubt about it. This is a work of art, and I mean, there's not much else for me to add. I think this is spectacular. I guess what I was trying to tie into is the fact that Roger Dubuis is going down the same path as. Uh, Richard Mille, right? Where you have, they, they have some pretty badass hor uh, uh, watches horologically that they've done over the past few years, but this is this is strictly, hey, there's no turbine, there's no mid repeater, yeah. they didn't feel the need to add all that. You're paying me for the work, for the aesthetics, and that's what it comes down I to. Still, I still think like Roger Dubuis has such some amazing, uh, you know, amazing watches in their history, like the Homage Chronograph, for example, uh, you know, some of their perpetual calendars, mineral repeaters they did, they still are so far away from what Roger Dubuis wanted the brand and what, conceptualized the brand. That's what happens when you get bought over by a group. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Because, again, to put it in context, Roger, Roger Dubuis worked for Patek Philippe and was inspired by a lot of the Patek Philippe Museum. This is not, nowhere, near, nowhere near anything well, Patek has ever made. how about the Lamborghini yeah. uh, spider turbines yeah, and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, Excaliburs right, right. and things of that nature. But Let's yeah. go to the next slide. And that is going to be our last slide. Well, we're going to talk about a few new Brightly releases. Brightly released a, uh, a new uh, Ford Must, uh, Ford yeah, yeah. A new Mustang turbine, which to me was reminiscent of a fake Brightly. But... The reason I wanted to throw in this one topic about Breitling is not necessarily about the release itself. So uh, basically, they made three new Super Oceans, right? Limited edition run, 88 pieces, which is a homage to Booker, 19, oh, 1888 founding year, right? And this is uh, basically exclusively made for now Rolex-owned Booker. So put that Rolex-owned Booker. Now, Breitling is a privately owned company. Has been, and they've been proud of it for many, many, many years. How do I put this properly? Is this Breitling being on Rolex's dick? It's so, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a technical <laughs> is that, term. Is that, is that a technical yeah, term, right? That's a technical artesian, term. Artesian, right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty artesian term. Um, I mean, listen, it's so tough to say because a lot of these releases are planned in advance. Um, so who knows if Breitling knew about Let's the Let's look at them real quick. Um, but, I mean, listen, there's not much thought that needs to go into this. It's literally taking an existing model line and just kind of changing up the color scheme. So, yeah, potentially. Look, I've worked with some brands in the past directly where I had clients overseas. Uh, and uh, one, one, one example comes to mind is a gentleman in Kazakhstan that had a big retail chain there. And he asked me to reach out to a brand that I had a relationship with and say, look, I need you to make me a cheap limited edition. I need the... Oh, was 100 pieces, uh, and those 100 pieces were existing models. They're plain Jane time only models, yeah. right? Which, uh, and he, he said, listen, I need it to be this, I need the retail to be this, I need the retail to be no more than $10,000, it has to be a cheap retail, and this is what, I, what I'm willing to pay per piece. So we ended up taking 200 existing watches from that brand, took, a crystal, took, the, took out the, uh, the crystal in the back, 
put a, a, a outfitted with a flag of Kazakhstan and the colors in general. And that's so I wouldn't be surprised that that's what was done here. So when you say this is planned in advance, this could have, this could have been planned last minute because again, these are nothing more but existing watches with just some colorful additional parts that didn't exist in the past. Yeah. So for me, again, I'm gonna ask you again, is Brightling maybe thinking since Rolex is in a buying mood, maybe, because I think that, at least in Breitling's eyes, they're probably their third largest competitor after Omega and Cartier. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think there's like IWC would probably come next, or mm, IWC's I don't got. Know. I don't think Breitling is even close. Breitling has been suffering a lot, especially at retail. Of late. I mean, they, they damn near became a closeout brand uh, for for a minute. If it wasn't for like the whole watch market boom, so yeah, I don't know. I don't think Breitling has. I any guess in terms of price point. Them. Yeah, that's true. But to price point, overall look and feel. Yeah. You know, you not don't... to mention they do also collaborations with Tudor and the whole Kinesi uh, connection. But yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I, so. I don't, I, again, I'm just speculating. I'm not saying that Breitling is trying to get bought over by Rolex, but certainly felt like one of those moves. I like it. I like the. I, take. I actually like the watches though. That's a hot take. I actually, I actually like the watches. No, I don't really. I like do. It. I like. The, I like the. Ba- <laughs> I, I like the baby blue. <laughs> yeah, that, that was. Not, I just don't understand why you have a minute track that big with a dial that small and then an outer bezel like it just it's so strange to me design design failure well now that you said it i can't see it yeah it just doesn't make sense you know at, at a first glance uh, i'm not a fan of the red one but uh at the first, blue pops the blue yeah nice. the blue does yeah. pop but i see what you're saying in terms of too many circles no it's just like out, out disproportionate i think that's all it is well guys i think that's it for us this week uh go eagles uh not niners and uh, we're gonna we're gonna stay on top of the Zaman story because I would love to see how that turns out. And uh, yeah, I don't know if that's gonna be something that's gonna be resolved by the next episode. But please do stay tuned for our next episode of Watch News Weekly. Thank you for tuning in this week. Like, comment, share, subscribe. We'll see you on the next one.